The Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry, or OCB, program was established in 2006 under the U.S. Carbon Cycle Program as a scientific coordination body for the ocean carbon research community, with funding from the National Science Foundation and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. OCB has grown and developed a network of nearly 2,000 scientists working together across subdisciplines of oceanography to understand the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle and how marine ecosystems and biogeochemical cycles are responding to environmental change. The global carbon cycle moves carbon in different forms throughout the Earth's system, including the land, the deep earth, the atmosphere, and the ocean. Covering 70% of the Earth's surface, the ocean plays a vital role in the global carbon cycle. The oceans store six to seven times more carbon than the land and atmosphere combined. Carbon occurs in many different forms in the ocean. Uh, one of the forms is dissolved carbon dioxide, which basically supports half of the photosynthesis on our planet. Carbonate ions form the building blocks for the shells and skeletons of marine plants and animals, including plankton, shellfish, and corals. Two key processes involved in the ocean carbon cycle are the solubility pump and the biological pump. The ocean solubility pump is a term that refers to the ocean uptake of CO2 via abiotic processes. Carbon dioxide uptake occurs in high latitude regions where cold water has a greater capacity to uptake CO2. These high latitude regions are windows of communication between the atmosphere and ocean and carbon dioxide taken up in these regions transits through the deep ocean with residence times of hundreds to thousands of years. On top of this natural cycle, the addition of anthropogenic carbon to the atmosphere pushes this whole balance towards uptake. So the high latitude regions are uptaking more carbon dioxide and the low latitude regions are outgassing less. This results in an overall increase in the amount of carbon in the ocean. The biological pump starts when small plant-like single-celled organisms called phytoplankton take carbon dioxide, which originally came from the atmosphere, and through photosynthesis, they turn it into their bodies, which are made of organic carbon, just like we are. And those tiny single-celled phytoplankton get eaten by larger animals and, and other organisms, and those through that ecosystem in the surface ocean, that organic matter originally produced by the phytoplankton can either be respired, burned up like we burn up food and breathed back out again as carbon dioxide, or a small amount of that organic matter will escape the surface sunlit part of the ocean where all this is happening and sink down into deep water. That results in overall a transfer of carbon dioxide from the surface ocean, which mixes and is in contact with the atmosphere, into deep water, which doesn't mix with the atmosphere as quickly, and it stays there for thousands of years. Earth system models project that over the 21st century there might be changes in the strength of the biological pump. This is a significant flux of carbon between the surface and the deep ocean. Even a small change in the biological pump could be a really strong feedback on the future progression of climate change. I've been working with data coming from the Ocean Observatories Initiative that has a new global array of autonomous gliders and moorings in the Erminger Sea of the North Atlantic. And these are our first opportunity to actually have measurements of biogeochemical properties throughout the full water column and throughout the full annual cycle, making measurements at times that it would just be impractical for us to be going out in ships and collecting samples. One of the ways the ocean community is studying the processes involved in the biological carbon pump right now is through a program that NASA has started called Export Processes in the Ocean Through Remote Sensing, Exports. And this is a group of scientists from many organizations and research institutions. We want to figure out how we can predict how quickly the biological pump is working. What we want to be able to do is take satellite imagery of the ocean color and the brightness of the ocean, figure out what kind of phytoplankton live in the ocean from those satellite images, and then through our field work, come up with models that help us predict how fast the biological carbon pump is working. OCB scientists are investigating how the ocean's capacity to absorb carbon is changing. 
The Southern Ocean is a critical region for studying the ocean's response to climate change. The Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling, or SOCOM, project is a National Science Foundation-funded, multi-institutional science effort focused on unlocking the mysteries of the Southern Ocean. It has an, an enormous influence on a number of important factors like, for example, the uh, heat balance of the earth, the uh, carbon balance of the earth, the uptake of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere by fossil fuel burning. It's a unique place in the world and we understand it very little because it's so, so difficult to observe. SOCOM is a unique experiment to instrument the Southern Ocean with robotic floats that will remotely sense how the ocean is changing. And in six years, we are going to have masses of data. Relative to their surface area, coastal regions represent some of the largest carbon fluxes in the global ocean. Tidal wetlands are often referred to as blue carbon systems. They have the capacity to sequester large amounts of carbon over long time scales. They provide storm surge protection for coastal communities and erosion protection. They also filter nutrients that are coming in from the landscape and so that reduces the nutrient load into estuaries and, and coastal areas. Um, these systems also provide an important habitat for animal communities and a lot of those animals are ecologically or economically important species that we rely on. One good way we use to measure export of carbon from wetland is using uh, in-situ sensors. The in-situ sensor not only measure the concentration of the carbon but also the water fluxes uh, in and out the marsh uh, or other wetlands. Then we can have a better estimate on how much carbon being exported. Marine ecosystems are experiencing unprecedented rates of change associated with rising atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and climate change, including warming, acidification, and changes in ocean circulation, nutrient input, and oxygen content. About 25 to 30 percent of the CO2 that's released from fossil fuel combustion ends up in the ocean. That lowers pH, and it also changes something we call saturation state, which is the corrosivity of that water. So when we talk about ocean acidification, what we're talking about is a change in carbonate chemistry of the ocean due to the increase in atmospheric CO2 from fossil fuel combustion, as well as other local processes that change that chemistry. And so the issue comes in is that we're changing that chemistry faster than we have in the last million years in the Earth's history. And that's having predictable consequences on the chemistry as well as consequences on the organism. The ocean supports an enormous diversity of life, including phytoplankton, microscopic plants at the base of the food web that generate half of the oxygen we breathe. Phytoplankton are an incredibly diverse set of organisms, and that diversity allows them to live in different places in the ocean and to have different combinations live in different places. And ocean acidification and warming are going to really change where they can live and what combinations can live together. For instance, warming is going to push the habitats poleward so that they're following the water that has the temperature that they're most adapted to. Ocean acidification is maybe a little more difficult to know how it's going to impact. Some of them may grow faster because of acidification, some may grow slower. That's really going to change how competitive they are, therefore which types will actually live coexist. So the community structure will change quite dramatically. One of the things we use are numerical models, so that's computer simulations of the oceans, the ocean physics, the ocean chemistry, and also the ocean biology. We can then actually push them into a future world. We can see what happens if we increase carbon dioxide, if the temperatures warm. A coral animal is a tiny, tiny animal called a polyp, maybe about a millimeter in diameter. These coral polyps work very, very hard, pulling calcium and carbonate ions out of the water and they're combining them together to form calcium carbonate. And they're using that calcium carbonate to build a calcium carbonate skeleton. What's happening as the pH declines is that the carbonate ion concentration in the seawater is going down as well. As corals have a harder and harder time building that skeleton, what we're starting to see is that in places that are more acidic, in coral reefs that are, are more acidic where the pH is low, we see that the corals are getting eaten away. Ocean acidification research is a multidisciplinary field of inquiry. And one of the things that OCB has done is, is to hold these workshops that allow for this disparate community to come together and share ideas and debate concepts and really move the science forward.